This is Nursing 622, Module 15, Domestic Violence Abuse. Upon completion of the module, your learning objectives is the signs of domestic violence, screening, treatment and prognosis for victims across the lifespan. When we look at substance abuse in women, the definition and scope is substance abuse disorder, which is a condition that use of drugs or alcohol can cause impairment, whether clinical, whether functional, causing health problems or a disability. This can include failure to meet major responsibilities at work with tasks that you have been presented, school or at home. Diagnostic criteria with the DSM-5 is important. The most common is alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, stimulant use disorder, hallucinogens or opioids. We look at age 12 years and older, 7.3% 7 of women, 11.5% of men. At the age of 12 to 17, it almost evens out. And then non-medical use of prescription medication is almost similar at the age of 12 and 17. <clears throat> we notice that tobacco use, smoking accumulates and takes place quite a bit, 40 million of all adults high correlation with mental disorders. We look at the risk factors. Again, a family health history is very important here. We look at the age, the sex, ethnicity, those cultural backgrounds, that genetic transmission and family history. We look at personality disorders, psychiatric disorders. Is there anxiety or stressors or something that has happened that has caused them to utilize this as their coping mechanism? Psychological, their personality, their coping styles. A lot of patients don't know how to cope and we have to help them with that. Do they have any self-esteem? We look at the social environmental. What did they grow up with? Did they have poor parenting when they were younger? Was there a lack of social support? Did they have access to these substances that make it very easy for them? Understanding that with women, we worry about pregnancy, the difference in gender roles, and then your DSM-5 criteria. What meets the criteria for substance abuse? Larger amounts, that persistent desire, I can't function unless I have it, that craving, you're unable to participate in any activities, that recurrent use, tolerance, and then ultimately withdrawal to where they reuse again. History is usually of substance abuse or a family history. You look at the age they first used, the last episode they used. And why do they feel they used? Was there a stressor? Was there something going on that they feel led them to that? Psychological disorders, mental health, developmental, family issues, stressors at work, any of the physical issues that could come into play. Do they have a developmental delay? Is there a cognitive impairment? Is there other issues, chronic health conditions contributing to this? We look at lab values. We wanna make sure we're ruling out any metabolic cause, right? So we're doing all the screenings. We're making sure that we're not missing anything that could be causing this abuse. We do the screening tools, looking at the addiction severity index. There is a female version. Treatment and management, motivational interviewing. We want to be cheerleaders for them. Give them the screening, look at the interventions, come up with a plan with them together. You don't dictate it to them. They need to be actively involved. Looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, think outside the box. It's not always pharmaceutical. What else can we do to help them? And then bringing it full circle and making the family be involved for this patient's success. When we look at the psychopharmacological interventions, we look at the treatment factors, the risk benefit analysis, pregnancy, are they of childbearing age, what other psychiatric disorders are going on. We look at those pre-treatment steps. Diagnosis, what's our goal? What's our short-term goal? What's our long-term goal? What's our plan of care? What do we hope to achieve here? Adherence to the plan, risks and benefits, and then frequent follow-ups. How are you doing with the plan? Do we need to tweak the plan? Is it working for you? Are you able to implement it? 
For alcohol use, we have medications that are FDA approved, opioids as well as nicotine. What works for the patient? What are the side effects? Are they predisposed to depression? Are we concerned about suicide? We need to make sure that we're looking at that when we look at different medications because they have a black box warning for suicide. And then again, those future directions. We need to train providers to see women as a different entity and look at substance abuse from that way. Don't use the stigmatizing language. Don't use, well, you are supposed to be the mom. You're supposed to be able to take care of them. Why can't you take care of them? What do you feel is making you not being able to take care of them? You're just further pushing them down to that coping mechanism that they've been using. Gender specific treatments. What do they identify as? Regardless of what they were born as, what do they identify as? That is a huge component here. Evaluating for co-occurring disorders. Are they recently postpartum? Is there any other issues going on? Are they veterans? Are they dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome? Is there anything else that you need to bring into the mix when you're developing the plan? Look at your evidence-based strategies. This is why we have research and data. What has been beneficial for these patients? Intimate partner violence is very significant, especially with women. 23.6% of women, 11.5% of men. Men appear to be a lower number. However, how many are undiagnosed? Does a man want to admit he's having domestic violence with a female? It's that whole stigma that I'm the man. This shouldn't be happening, right? It can be physical abuse. It can be emotional, coercive behavior, sexual intimate partner violence. And this is why we screen for it during pregnancy. We look at sexual violence. Is it unwanted? It doesn't matter that they're in a relationship together. Is it truly unwanted? Are they being forced to do things they don't want to do? This includes intercourse, sexual activities, rape, stalking. These are all things that come into play with domestic violence. Looking at the etiology and risk factors that we see with the cycle of violence, we notice that there is a cycle. <clears throat> There's that honeymoon phase, as we call it. As the relationship grows, tension builds. There's a violent episode. Oh, I'll never do it again from either party. And then it becomes more recurrent, and then it becomes everyday life. What are your risk factors? Have they been in an abusive relationship before? Have they had alcohol or substance abuse? Are they young? Have they had other sexual partners? Is there issues with poverty and they feel there's no way, no way out and they're stuck there so they have to deal with it? Have they grown up around domestic violence? Is there conflict in the relationship? They don't know how to cope with it and they just accept the behavior. We look at the physical, we look at the injuries that can occur, headaches, back pain, insomnias, digestive problems. Again, we see this with anxiety as well. Do they have anxiety secondary to the fact that they are undergoing domestic violence? Absolutely could be possible. We need to investigate further. Look at reproductive, abdominal pain, decreased sexual desire, genital irritation, vaginal problems, fear of STDs, finding out what's going on underneath in the underlying problem. Healthcare <clears throat> use among survivors for usage and mental health effects, we see that's higher than those and have a higher healthcare cost. The mental health effects, the self-blame, the guilt and shame that we see from interpartner violence, right? Suicide, post-traumatic stress, the interpersonal difficulties, they're not able to cope and manage with other people. So the evaluation and assessment for these partner violence is the assessment findings. If you suspect it, you need to report it. You need to have frequent follow-up and visits. Give them resources that are available. Do your assessment techniques in private. If you have to say, listen, this has to be a female to female, or I have to do his male examination on my own, this gives you that little bit of time to try to figure out what's going on. Use those screening tools. They are available. If you can't do it in the office, give them the resources to be able to do them on their own and then further follow up with them. And again, document your findings.
your discussions. Questions you should talk to the patient about. Are you in immediate danger? Can you go somewhere safe if you can't go home? Are you worried that things have gotten worse? Have you ever been threatened for you or your children? That heightens the level, right? If there is a concern that children are involved and that your the patient's life is being endangered, that brings it to a whole nother level. We look at these focus intervention with immediate care for physical and injuries, assessment plan for safety, safe housing, family members, <clears throat> those support systems, and again, referrals, social services, getting them in touch with those crisis hotlines, those shelters, those support groups, and legal aid. You might not know exactly what's there, but having those resources to give them so it can be further investigated is so important. You might be the only person that they talk to. We look at the nursing care of sexual assault survivors. Um, the SANE assault nurse examiner is usually, uh, can be an RN, you can have an NP. There's multiple programs where NPs are contracted out to bring them out of the emergency room and hospital in a safe environment to evaluate for sexual assault. You collect the forensic event evidence. It's a collaboration with PD as well as counseling and it's ongoing. There is an outreach, there is an engagement where we come full circle and we make sure that everybody is taken care of, including the family members that it affects. We look at those resources, the crisis intervention, those parenting supports, mental health. Again, if it is your child, the parents need support as well as the child. Understanding that medical health care might be needed, but also that psychosocial component. And again, your references with textbook readings and additional resources.